Welcome to Bellingham Voices. I'm your host, Marie Marchand. I'm so happy that you've joined us. Today, we have a show that's focused on animals, both domestic and wild. And we have two guest experts to help us on this journey, Laura Clark and Alicia Elsby. Laura is the executive director of the Whatcom Humane Society. And Alicia is the manager of the Wildlife Rehabilitation Center, which is a program of the Humane Society. And welcome to the show, ladies. Thanks Thank for you. having us. Nice to have you with us. So Laura, let's start with you. Alrighty. Um, the city of Bellingham contracts with the Whatcom Humane Society for uh, officer control purposes. And I'm wondering how many officers you have and what are their duties? Well, thanks for having us. So yes, the Whatcom Humane Society has a long-standing relationship with the city of Bellingham to provide animal control services. We have done so since the early 70s. We currently employ seven full-time animal control officers that work not only in Bellingham, but all of Whatcom County 24 seven, and they provide animal control services. So any kind of thing you can think of, picking up of stray animals, injured animals, animals running in traffic. Uh, if you think that an animal is being neglected or abused, Used, you'll want to contact our animal control officers and they will respond. Mm -hmm. And so you're well known for that and you're also well known for adoptions. Of course. Great, yes. That's the fun part of the Humane Society. <laughs> what are some other programs that you run? Sure. Well, we have been uh, providing well, caring for animals in, in Whatcom County and Bellingham specifically since 1902, so that's a very long time, and as well as adopting animals uh, that need new homes. We also provide low-cost spay-neuter services to the public. We have a pet food bank that provides pet food assistance for low-income um, residents who need a little help with their animals. We have humane education programs. One of our great programs coming up this summer is our Kids Camp, Critter Camp, which is a day camp for kids where they come and spend a week at the shelter learning all about animals and all things animal related. Um, our volunteer program, which we can't do what we do without our volunteers. And then of course, one of our newer programs is our wildlife rehabilitation services program that provides care to orphaned and injured native wildlife throughout Whatcom County. And that's an amazing program. Mm -hmm. And I just took a tour there with Leisha and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, one thing I wanted to add was the microchipping you do. Absolutely. So microchipping is a permanent form of identification. It's a little chip about the size of a grain of rice. It's administered much like a vaccine in between your animal's shoulder blades. That chip has a number that can be traced back to you and that chip can be registered nationwide. So if you're camping in Montana this summer and your animal gets lost and ends up in a shelter or a vet clinic, your animal will be scanned, the chip number will come up and it's a great way for you to be reunited with your pet. And with 4th of July, coming up especially it's so important to have identification on your animals so we offer low-cost microchipping $20 no appointment necessary you can just bring your animal down and we can chip the animal and register that chip for you oh that's great and that's what I'm gonna do with my two dogs good job callers with my phone number on it but that sometimes could get lost so some things to be concerned about for people in the summer dogs and hot cars and oh. leashing and scooping the poop. Maybe you could talk about those a little bit. Absolutely. So those are three three really important things. So first and foremost, we're going to have a hot summer. We just know we are. And we see so many animals being left in the car. Now, people think, well, I only left the animal for just a few minutes while I ran into the store. But it just takes a few minutes for the inside of your car, even with the windows open, even parked in the shade, to get to dangerously high temperatures. So First of all, just leave your animal at home. It doesn't matter if it's a dog, cat, bunny, whatever. Just leave them at home where they're safe. They can stay cool. You can go enjoy your summertime activities. But if you are out and about and you see an animal in need, you're going to want to call the Whatcom Humane Society, 733-2080. Get to our animal control dispatcher. Give them a description of the car, the location of the car, location is really important plus the license plate of the vehicle if you can and then a description of the animal inside. Mm -hmm. If you see an animal and it's after hours, you can call 911. They will dispatch one of our animal control officers. We work 24 seven, so it's not a problem. Again, you're gonna to wanna to give the 911 dispatcher that information so we can respond. We can remove the animal from the vehicle and the owner can face several different charges up to and including second degree animal cruelty. So it's really important just, if you're a pet owner, leave the animal at home. If you see a pet in need, give us a call. Mm -hmm. In terms of leashing, 
there's so many great off-leash areas here in Bellingham especially. You can visit the City of Bellingham's website to get that information. You can go to the Whatcom Humane Society's website. Have your animal enjoy those off-leash areas, but on those leashed areas, put your dog on leash. Marie, you and I were talking about, mm -hmm. you know, your dog may be great off-leash, but other dogs aren't, so you have to be respectful, and it is the law. You can be issued a citation for not being responsible if your animal's just running at large and being inappropriate around other animals, as well as this super important thing, pick up after your animal. Scoop the poop, scoop the poop. <laughs> Bellingham's all about scooping the poop. It's safe, it's respectful. Bag it up, put it in a garbage can. Just make sure that everybody, two and four legged here in the community can enjoy the great outdoors. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. I wanna uh, talk to you about your dog walkers cadre, but let's move on to Alicia for a moment. Um, so when I went to the Wildlife Rehabilitation Center and got a tour from you, I was just, I have to say, so impressed by you. Um, you. You're very knowledgeable and being so young, is, it's extremely impressive. So tell us a little bit about your background. You had wanted to be in this field for quite a while. Yeah, I have. Um, I've always really been interested in animals, you know, ever since I was knee high to grasshopper. Um, and I started basically volunteering at a wildlife center when I was 15. Started, you know, preparing diets, getting to know the animals, the species, in taking patients and then I got a job at a veterinary hospital being like a kennel attendant and then moved on to a veterinary assistant. There we took in a lot of wildlife as well so I was able to kind of get the medical aspect of the wildlife care and I really decided that's what I wanted to do. So then throughout high school I kept those two jobs and then went straight to veterinary technician school, got my um, veterinary technician license and then kind of you know still maintained contact with domestic animal side of working so that I could learn the skills for wildlife and then kept volunteering, kept doing internships, kept having different jobs in wildlife until I found um, the wildlife center that I'm at now and just continued to grow my skills and kept doing that. You're very passionate about it. That comes yes. through. <laughs> yes, I love it. And now you make the big bucks, right? Oh, yes. <laughs> Rolling in the dough. <laughs> so give us a, an idea of what the facility is like. Um, so it is It is small. It is run out of an old farmhouse. Um, we started years ago with only about 500 patients a year. So, you know, it kind of met the needs for that. But now we have way outgrown it. Um, you know, we get 1,500 to 2,000 patients a year. And so that's a lot coming through. We definitely have a lot of different, you know, rooms, setups, enclosures for each animal, different flight cages, depending on if it's, you know, a Stellar's J to a bald eagle, um, you know, facilities for ungulates like our deer, elk, moose, kind of a wide variety of different um, needs for those animals. So we definitely take them all in. If it's something that we are not able to care for long term or a very quick turnaround, um, then we have different cage setups, different permits that we use in order to facilitate that species. And what injuries are they coming to you with? That's a, there's a whole gamut. Uh, we definitely get, I would say 90% is human interference, which is why wildlife rehabilitation exists, is, you know, we, we, we have an ethical relationship and, you know, thing that we need to do for those animals that we interfere with and that we cause these injuries. So a lot of hit by car. Um, it is baby season right now. We are in the midst of orphans coming in all the time. And people have the best intentions when they see a little baby animal um, and sometimes bring it to the facility and we actually don't need to take it in. There's nothing wrong with it. Specifically deer fawns. Mom leaves them for four to six hours. She is nowhere near. She's off grazing. She parks them. They stay in that spot. They actually have scent glands. So they close those when they're waiting for mom so nothing can really detect them so they're actually pretty safe and they're pretty camouflaged you know and a well-meaning person walks by sees it and says oh no an orphan fawn and it's the great intention to get it to us and then sometimes we get that animal you know we do a certain test to make sure that it's okay and not orphan and it turns out to be a hundred percent fine and so then we have to try to find mom reunite it with mom which sometimes we're successful we've done about 12 of those this year which that's a really high number and something I'm super excited about mm -hmm. Um, but sometimes, you know, we can't find mom or something's happened, so then we have that animal and it didn't really need to be brought in. Uh, we also deal with things like there's, um, there's poaching, so we deal with bow and arrows, we deal with um, shootings, a lot of entanglement, specifically with deer, so they get caught in netting, volleyball nets, basketball hoops, you name it, it comes to the door. So we see lots of different injuries. Sometimes some are natural, um, you know, it's old age, things like that, and um, they get 
they just can't feed themselves, they can't care for themselves, so they'll come to us. And then another one specifically that's, you know, in the environment is lead poisoning. Um, we see that in our waterfowl, specifically swans, in very high numbers. And so that's something we're working to, you know, research and correct, but it is in the environment. So I would say 90% come in due to something humans have created. When I went to visit, <clears throat> um, I saw a lot of animals that, you know, were injured and I, my heart kind of expanded and I just was like, oh my gosh, you know, I just, I felt really connected to them. I wanted to comfort them. It's kind of like humans have this parenting instinct and it, it, it kicks in around animals because they're so vulnerable. And, um, <clears throat> but you taught me that you're not supposed to really be overly nice to them because you don't want the animal to imprint on you and not be afraid of humans in the future because that would endanger them. T talk about that a little bit. That's a really good point and it is so hard. You know, when you see that little baby fawn come to the door, you do want to cuddle it, but taking a step back and realizing that if you really want to do what's best for that animal, that you're going to be as hands-off as possible and replicate mother nature as much as possible. So replicating what the mom would be doing, replicating the same sounds, you know, wearing disguises, especially with our babies that we know are vulnerable to imprinting pretty quickly. We go at gr to great lengths to make sure that they do not associate humans with food, humans with care, anything like that. Um, even just adult patients that come in, comforting them is something that, you know, it is something we want to do and we take a step back and realize they are terrified of us. They are wildlife. They're not supposed to be domesticated. They're not supposed to be around humans. So when you think about, um, let's say an adult bald eagle, if it gets to the point where humans are able to capture and do something, there is something very, very wrong with that animal and they're extremely stressed to begin with. They're scared. So when we talk to them, pet them, cuddle them, that is just terrifying to them. And it, you know, we do actually see species, um, cottontails for instance, they can die just from stress, just from people holding them, petting them, handling them. You know, so we definitely try our best to, you know, if you really want to do what's best for those animals, just keeping them quiet, safe, dark, and giving us a call before, you know, handling them more mm -hmm. than necessary. What is that number that people should call if they see an injured, orphaned, or sick animal? It's 360-966-8845. Wonderful. And we're going to take a short break. And we'll be right back with our guests. Public Works Engineer with the City of Bellingham. The City is working to create a safe, well-connected bicycle network to encourage bicycling by all members of our community. New facilities will make it safer and easier for both cyclists and motorists to share our city streets. Some of the new facilities can be seen at a recent project on Ohio Street. At the Ohio Street and Cornwall Avenue intersection, we've installed bike boxes. A bike box is a green painted space at the head of a traffic lane that provides bicyclists with a safe and visible place to wait at a red light. Bicyclists enter the bike box from the bike lane and stop ahead of the cars. Motorists must stop behind the box and are not allowed to make a right turn at a red light. Once the light turns green, drivers should look over their right shoulder to check for bicyclists before making a right turn. A bike box increases the visibility of bicyclists, helps prevent right hook conflicts with right turning cars or buses, groups bicyclists together to clear an intersection quickly when the light turns green, and enables left turning bicyclists to position themselves to the front prior to getting a green signal. Sometimes it can be difficult for bicyclists to get the light to change green when there aren't any cars around. This bike detector stencil shows a bicyclist exactly where to place their bike to trigger the green light. Green paint highlights areas where bicycles and cars cross paths. The green pavement area alerts both drivers and bicyclists to pay extra attention. Shared lane markings, or sharrows, guide bicyclists to the safest place on the street to ride and help motorists expect to see and share the lane with bicyclists. They also provide wayfinding along a bike route. Shared lane markings with green background direct bicyclists across busy intersections and increase motorists' awareness of the bicyclists. So hop on your bike and come try out these new facilities. You'll soon be seeing more as we work to complete our citywide bicycle network.
Welcome back to Bellingham Voices. I'm here with Laura Clark and Alicia Elsby. So Laura, when I visited this center, I was very impressed by the dog walking system that you have and just the number of dog walkers that you have and then the number of times each dog is walked. And I have to say, I left feeling very good that, that the animals there are well taken care of. It was very moving. Uh, my animals get like one, maybe two walks a day, but these animals, you ensure that they get many walks. And then also there were volunteers there just dedicated to, I saw somebody playing with a cat. I mean, that is really remarkable. Well, uh, the Walk and Humane Society volunteers, I'm a little prejudiced, but we think they're the best volunteers in the entire world. And so, for example, last year in 2015, I think we had over 260 active volunteers um, at our Division Street facility, our farm facility, and at our wildlife center, and they volunteered 30,000 hours of time or some incredible number like that. So, I mean, they're just the, the most dedicated folks. And for information on how to become a volunteer, you can just go to our website, walkhumane.org. Um, so our dog walking volunteers specifically are trained by professional dog trainers, positive reward-based dog trainers who donate their time to help our volunteers learn how to most humanely um, handle the shelter dogs that come in. We get a lot of what we call juvenile delinquents that come into the shelter that have never walked on a leash. They don't have any basic manners. And it's our volunteers job to help them learn those basic skills so that they can be more adoptable and that we can place them in the most appropriate homes possible. And so the, the volunteer dog trainers color code each dog based on their behavior and what they know. So for example, green dogs are those happy-go-lucky dogs that really even the most inexperienced volunteer can walk. We have nine acres of land behind our shelter that has a large dog walking trail, as well as two large um, fenced exercise yards. So those ball-obsessed border collies can go play ball all day long. And so we have green dogs and yellow dogs and red dogs and the red dogs are those dogs that are a little more difficult they have some behavior problems and the volunteers that walk them are the most experienced volunteers and they've gone through specialized training so each dog is walked numerous times daily and then they have a little volunteer report card and the volunteers write notes about them that not only helps other volunteers but it also helps the public that are interested in adopting the animal learn more about their behavior and what they're good at and what they might need some help with. And again, the goal is to place the animal in the most appropriate home where their needs will be met and the adopter's needs will be met. So it's a really great thing. Mm -hmm. Alicia, I wanted to ask you something uh, because I have little dogs and my friend told me to be careful of deer this time of year because it could hurt a deer could hurt my dog and I had never heard that before because I don't see them as aggressive. I mean, they're not carnivores. So is that the case that uh, dog owners have to be careful of deer? Um, well, this time of year with wildlife is baby season. So moms are having their babies and they're very protective. Um, either that is biologically what they are meant to do and so they take that very seriously. So deer in particular, they are a prey species. Um, they're very large, but they're still a prey species. And so they definitely um, are fearful of, you know, dogs, if there's anything human-wise that could be a threat, they take all those things very threatening and they park their little fawns, like we were talking about, just in one spot. The fawns are not to move. They're not walking around with mom generally. They're just kind of parked there. So if a dog is coming near their baby, they know and they are gonna do what they have to do to defend it. That's part of being you know, a mom and being wild is they can't pick somewhere where there's gonna be no humans, no animals. They have to you know, live with us and with our pets and so dogs sometimes they'll you know walk up they don't really know that the baby's there they stumble upon it the baby cries or moves and mom's like whoa what's going on and she will try to defend her baby and so that sometimes happens we do see that um, it is very sad uh, but we do see a lot of issues like we were talking about we do not want to imprint animals, especially deer, but there are a lot of well-meaning people who will feed the wildlife and we actually see much more of the aggression, especially with moms, in animals that have been hand-fed because there's no fear of humans and there's no fear of dogs because they've been taught that if they come to this house or that if they come here or there, they get food. So they learn to, okay, humans aren't so bad, dogs aren't so bad, and then when it comes time to defend that baby, they are all over it because they don't want anything to happen. We see many more issues with those deer that have been um, habituated to humans, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. 
So you mentioned on the tour that you gave me that you have interns that stay there during the summers. Is that right? Yes, that is definitely the only way that we can run in the summer is those dedicated interns. Uh, they come literally from all over the world. We've had some from Turkey, from Germany, from Australia. Uh, most of them are from the United States. And so they come to the facility and spend two to four months anywhere in there helping learn about wildlife rehabilitation and helping us with those patients. So they generally have a little bit of a background in animal care or they're hoping to go into this field or they're in veterinary school, you know, zookeeping, all of those types of things is what they are interested in. And then they come to the facility. We have a room that is actually within the center. So they are immersed into <laughs> the depths of it um, and they stay there. And then that way they can pop on shift. Typically it's eight to 10 hours a day. But if we really get in a pinch, um, yesterday morning we almost had a deer tranquilization that we had to do, a rescue. And it was kind of like, hey guys, you're not on till noon, but we need someone to feed these baby animals. And since you guys are staying here, you know that's part of what's going to happen. They jump on in enthusiastically and make sure that they are taking care of those animals. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely a big blessing for us that they get to be on um, site. And I personally have gone through internships where I've lived on site. And it is extremely rewarding because you get to be involved in all aspects and you get to really know what is going on at the Wildlife Center. What's the minimum age for that? 18 years, yes. And so today you've got, you've got your scrubs on and you've got like a little blood and some dirt. So like what kind of animals were you handling this morning? Um, this morning I was actually handling a fawn that got sadly hit by a car. It was trying to cross the road after mom and sometimes they just are a little slow and they're very tiny so people don't always see them. But thankfully the lady had saw it just as, you know, she just kind of clipped it just a little bit. But it did get a bit of a bloody nose from it. So I was handling it up to pick it up and get it into our rescue vehicle to get it back for immediate care. So there's there's a little bit on there, you know, we definitely, this is not, not a glamorous job. There is a lot of dirty work and, you know, got formula going down here. It's just kind of what happens. We definitely make sure the animals get the care they need before worrying about our clothes, that's for sure. <laughs> So you bring up a good point is that drivers have to be really careful, especially this time of year with the deer because yeah. so, we live in a wilderness pretty much and we have to be careful. Yeah, we, I mean, Bellingham is so beautiful and Whatcom County in general, we are so lucky. But in part of being lucky is that we wildlife live in our backyards, literally, that is what's going on. Um, they have learned to adapt to urbanization. So they've learned that, you know, cars are dangerous, but sometimes those deer that are especially first time moms or maybe have been a bit more from a wild setting and made their way into an urban setting. They know a car is a threat, but they don't necessarily know what's going to happen. So they sometimes pick the most inopportune times to cross with their babies. It's definitely a learning experience. And so if drivers can just have a little bit of extra caution for deer, especially, they like to dart out pretty fast, you know, and knowing that this time of year, a female deer will probably have fawns close behind her. That definitely helps us out and helps them out. So we don't have to go and do these rescues mm -hmm. with them getting hit. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering what is one thing that your center is in dire need of. Now it could be a dream and then the reality, <laughs> or it can be, you know, whatever you want to let people out there know that you need. Um, the dream and what needs to be reality is a new facility for sure. We definitely are in great need of that. We have maxed out our space um, and our resources, so we really are looking to um, in the future build something that can accommodate the growing needs of Whatcom County and beyond. Um, in the interim until that happens. We actually really need uh, what we call brows, which is essentially clippings from fruit trees, uh, deciduous trees that people have in their backyard. So apple, plum, cottonwood, you know, the poplars, alders, any of those very leafy trees or bushes um, that produce nice green leaves. And that's what our deer eat. So we try to, we do not try to give commercial foods or foods that would be found you know in everybody's um, like pet food type things we want to use what's in the natural environment and so what mom does for those babies is she teaches them to eat different kinds of plants and so we've researched which one which ones they like what's best for them and so those particularly the fruit trees they really like those because they're a bit sweeter with that sap and so that's what we teach them to eat so when they go out into the wild they're not looking for human food or for grain from humans they're looking for leaves and bushes so they will have the best success in the wild and you know we go through two pickup like truck loads a day of those clippings to feed all of our fawns and so that is something that we greatly greatly need and you know 
if someone can drop them off, that's even better because mm -hmm. we were running on such a skeleton crew to get everybody done that to take precious time away from those rescues and those patients, you know, it definitely is really helpful if the public can just drop it off, just drop off those branches, we'll get them where they need to go and make sure that the deer get enough food. Mm -hmm. And Laura, how is the Whatcom Humane Society funded? Well, that's a great question. So for example, the Wildlife Center is funded entirely by donations, 100%. So uh, again, of course, monetary, but also in-kind donations are vital to keep the center running. We are the animal control provider for not only Bellingham, but also Whatcom County. So we do contract with those municipalities and they do pay us a set fee to provide that service. However, those services are subsidized by donor dollars. Um, we also collect fees for things like dog licensing and adoption fees um, if your animal gosh forbid gets out and is impounded into the facility the various municipalities do set fees that we collect and keep to help fund the operations to provide those services to help the animals in our community but for the most part we are a nonprofit organization we are a 501 c3 and we are dependent on private donations grant money um, in-kind donations and many of our programs again like the wildlife center are funded entirely by donations so we're really lucky to be in this community and have have such great community support, but every little bit helps. Mm -hmm. I admire the work that you two do very much. <laughs> a question that I ask all of the guests on Bellingham Voices is, what's your favorite thing to do in Bellingham? So, Laura? Oh, my favorite thing to do in Bellingham? Well, I, I don't want to speak for Alicia, she'll speak for herself, but as an animal shelter worker, <laughs> You work, that's your favorite thing to do in general. <laughs> um, but I'm really, I love our community. I'm very lucky to, to live here. So when I do have a free spare moment, um, I like to spend time with my own animals, of course, and um, enjoy the great parks and, and everything that Bellingham and Whatcom County has to offer. And then of course, sleep. <laughs> sleep is a, is a big one for me. We haven't had anybody say that yet. Sleep so is my favorite out activity, actually. <laughs> How about you? I'm going to be kind of repetitious of Laura, but definitely, you know, working a lot. That is that is my life. This job is my, you know, my life, um, not just a career. But outside of that, if I do have a spare minute, I have a little dog. And so I really like to take her for hikes and walks um, and just enjoy, you know, the ocean, especially. I love that. Mm -hmm. So it's one of our favorite things to do. Thank you. And thanks to both of you for being on our show and giving enlightening information to our audience. And thanks for the care that you provide for the animals in our community. It's very touching. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on Bellingham Voices. We'll see you next time.